Okay, well, people are still joining, but I'm just going to kick off by saying thanking you for joining us for the fifth session of our 2021 ISPD Virtual Education Series. I'm Lynn Chitty, I'm the current president of ISPD, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Um, today we're focused on the genetic aspects of increased nuchal translucency, and we're going to first hear from Lisa Hoy, um, followed by Dr. Rhiannon Mellis. But before we get started, I've just got a few announcements to share. If you need any technical assistance, please can you use the chat function uh, for support. We have somebody on the line who can hopefully help you if you get stuck. And throughout the presentation, as we go, you can submit questions for the presenters in the Q&A function. And we'll either address these at the end of the session or I will try and answer some as we go. Um, I don't think we're going to have time for individual questions, so uh, I don't think it's going to be worth putting your hands up because we've got quite a full schedule. And I'd just like to say that the event is being recorded, uh, and so definitely don't put your hand up to ask a question or submit a question to the q and if, uh, if you don't want to be recorded. So where are we now? Well, we've got nearly 150 people, so I'm going to start by introducing our first speaker, who is Lisa Hoy. She is an Associate Professor in Maternal Fetal Medicine at the Mercy Hospital for Women and the Department of Obstetrics and Gynaecology at the University of Melbourne in Australia. She's an ISPD board member and Associate Editor for Prenatal Diagnosis. Now, due to the time differences, Lisa has pre-recorded her talk. So we can now view the presentation from Dr. Hoy. And as I've said, I will try and answer questions for you in the chat as we go. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you're calling in from. My name is Lisa Hoy. I'm a maternal fetal medicine specialist at the University of Melbourne and the Mercy Hospital for Women in Melbourne. So I'm sorry I'm not giving this talk live, but I hope you'll understand it's 3 a.m. in Melbourne time. So I'm going to um, give my talk in recorded form and trust that um, the chair and my other speaker will be well equipped to answer any of your questions that uh, come up after my talk. So um, today, today's virtual education series is on the topic, the increased nuchal translucency in the era of NIPT. And my talk today is based on a review article that I wrote with um, my colleagues at um, the Mercy Hospital for Women, um, where we look at the evidence and synthesize um, what it tells us about how we manage this increasingly common clinical dilemma. So um, you'll all be aware of the enormous changes that have been um, occurring in prenatal screening for fetal chromosome conditions. And we've now arrived at a, um, a situation where we have very good options for first trimester screening for Down syndrome and other chromosome conditions. And in the setting in which I work in Australia, the first trimester combined test and non-invasive non prenatal testing are the two most common screening tests employed by pregnant women. And in our country, over 80% of all pregnant women do choose to have some form of screening. So how does, how, what have we seen in our context in the past few years? We've seen um, increasing uptake of NIPT and we've also seen that it performs as well as we would expect um, from the research literature. So this study here is uh, results from a large perinatal record linkage study that we performed. These data come from 2015, so already um, a little bit old, but I think it reflects, um, uh, still reflects our current uh, experience. So we have uh, most women, um, electing to have combined first trimester screening as their primary screening test. And you can see that it performs quite well, um, a detection rate of almost 90% for trisomies 13, 18 and 21 combined with a screen positive rate below 3%. And that's because the majority of these tests are now performed, uh, incorporating the nasal bone into the algorithm, which we know reduces the false positive rate. <clears throat> 
Uh, NIPT as a primary screening test was used by over 12,000 women in our state um, and we have a, over 70,000 births per year and the detection rate for the common autosomal aneuploidies was 100% with a screen positive rate of 1.2% for these three autosomal trisomies. However, it was interesting to note that the screen positive rate doubled once you include positive results for the sex chromosomes and other conditions that may be included on the NIPT assay. So we have a, a variety of available NIPT products um, and this is what our real world experience is like. So the screen positive rate actually is not that far behind that of the first trimester combined test, but it still has superior sensitivity. So how are clinicians and women uh, navigating all the options for, for screening these days? This is how NIPT was initially positioned when it was introduced in Australia and indeed around the world. It was um, initially introduced as a second tier screening test after a primary screening test. So it was usually, in the beginning it was only offered to women who already had a um, high probability result. However, what we have seen evolve in our high income setting is that women are now choosing to have NIPT as their primary aneuploidy screening test, but they are retaining the 11 to 13 week ultrasound, the so-called nuchal translucency ultrasound, for the benefit of early detection of structural abnormalities, because we know, of course, that that is also associated with an increased chance of a chromosome condition. So this is, um, I guess, what the uh, common algorithm is for women who can afford this option. We think that uh, at the moment, probably over 25% of Australian women in metropolitan areas choose NIPT as their primary screening test. And typically they access this very early at 10 to 12 weeks. Uh, most women are still then uh, going ahead and having a 12 to 13 week ultrasound. And um, being advised or having a diagnostic test offered if there's a um, abnormality seen on the ultrasound or a increased risk uh, NIPT result. So this leads us into the actual clinical scenario that we're going to discuss today. We have um, NIPT as a highly sensitive and uh, specific screening test that's very popular, but we're also doing the NT scan concurrently. And so we're now having to come up with algorithm, um, clinical pathways for women who have a low risk NIPT result, but an increased nuchal translucency without a structural abnormality um, and you know, navigate the increasingly complicated and expensive options for uh, downstream genomic testing. So actually the first question that we wanted to answer um, in our group was actually how big is too big for a nuchal translucency measurement these days? We're no longer using the um, combined first trimester screening algorithm that incorporates gestational age, crown rump length and maternal age to tell us what the final probability is. We're just uh, doing a raw measurement now. And I think everyone still agrees that the conventional or traditional definition of an increased nuchal translucency measurement that warrants, you know, that warrants ongoing um, investigation as a standalone indication is 3.5 millimeters or greater. So that still that hasn't changed, but other definitions have started to creep into the literature. So the American, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in their most recent clinical management guideline have suggested that a nuchal translucency is should be considered considered elevated if it's more than three millimeters or greater than the 99th centre. So the, the ambiguity contained in this recommendation is that they're not these are not equivalent definitions. So three millimetres is not the same as the 99th centre. So uh, choosing which one you're going to go with um, isn't that uh, straightforward. The International Society for Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynaecology refer uh, members to uh, comply with local guidelines. And when we look at our local guidelines here in Australasia, um, this Australasian Society of Ultrasound in Measurement, uh, Ultrasound in Me Medicine actually sit on the fence as well and say that it's somewhere greater than 3 to 3.5. 
but they do make the point that you do have to account for gestational age when you decide whether a nuchal translucency measurement is increased or not. So we um, went about trying to define um, what to, how big is too big using our, um, our statewide data set on combined first trimester screening. And this is a chart showing the uh, range of nuchal translucency measurements in over 80,000 singleton pregnancies in Victoria. Um, so this light grey line is exactly one, is the median, is the median. Uh, the dark black line is 1.9 multiples of the median. And the gray, dark grey line here is 1.6 multiples of the median. And you can see that if you use a fixed threshold of 3.5, you will capture only a small proportion of pregnancies. So this turns out to be about 0.6% of all pregnancies, but you're more likely to capture the larger babies or the ones with the longest crown rump length, which makes sense because we know that the nuchal translucency measurement increases with gestational age in euploid pregnancies. If you take a fixed cutoff of three millimeters, you then double the number of uh, pregnancies that you uh, place into this high risk category and you can see that you start to uh, include more uh, fetuses simply based on a lower um, CRL. So, you know, unlike most other measurements where we have a gestational age specific definition, the nuchal translucency um, is still something that we've been talking about as a fixed measurement. So we had a look at um, the different thresholds for the definitions of an increased nuchal translucency looked at the frequency of atypical chromosome abnormalities by each group and we concluded that the, the threshold of 3.5 millimeters is still absolutely a appropriate threshold to identify those at a higher with a higher chance of a chromosome uh, condition if you're going to use a definition that's lower than 3.5 millimeters it's better to use the 99th centile or 1.9 multiples of the median. In, in, our, um, in our setting, the nuchal is, is often reported as multiples of the median rather than centile. And if you use this, you'll actually still get the same detection rate as using a nuchal translucency measurement cutoff of 3.0 millimeters, but you'll get fewer false positives. So um, that we were able to use our very large uh, linked data set to demonstrate this, and I'm sure it's intuitive. It's not anything that we wouldn't expect to find. It's better to use a gestational age specific cutoff uh, for an increased nuchal translucency measurement. So why are we still measuring the nuchal translucency? We've got such a good screening test with uh, non-invasive prenatal testing. Um, it's because it, obviously there are other chromosome conditions that are not going to be detected by NIPT, but there are also other things such as structural abnormalities um, that we have to look closely for if we see an increased nuchal. So these are some of the common, like the main groups of conditions that are associated with an increased nuchal translucency measurement and the most common example. And I've listed them here just because it makes it um, easier when you're counselling women usually want an example of the sorts of conditions we're um, talking about. Um, and so the most common type of structural abnormality in a euploid fetus with an increased nuchal translucency measurement is a cardiac anomaly. The most common microdeletion would be the 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome. Noonan syndrome is the most common single gene disorder. And then other chromosomal conditions that may or may not be detectable depending on with NIPT, depending on the one which has been used, uh, would be uh, triploidy. And then the other information we get from measuring the nuchal translucency measurement is actually just an overall chance of an adverse obstetric outcome, including spontaneous miscarriage or stillbirth. And you can see that the chance of an abnormal outcome increases with the size of the nuchal translucency measurement. And once you're getting up to measurements of 6.5 millimetres or greater, then um, your risk of an abnormal outcome is very high, almost 8 in 10. So 
when we're talking to women who've been referred with an increased nuchal translucency measurement, um, but uh, a low risk NIPT, women are often, often asked, well, I spent almost $500 on that test. What did it tell me? And uh, why, did I, why, did, why was I spending that money? Uh, when you're telling me I need further testing now. So I guess we always want to have a look at what sort of um, NIPT uh, test was uh, performed and there's an increasing range of uh, things. These are just some of the common types that we would come across in our, um, in our setting. But at the end of the day, we tell women, look, even um, uh, whatever sort of test you've had, it's still a screening test, it's not diagnostic. And it will not, uh, there's no single NIPT assay that will test for every condition um, and every micro deletion. So although we um, can talk about what's been excluded at the end of the, at the end of the day, we're still offering diagnostic testing. The sorts of chromosomes that we will be looking for when we do this diagnostic testing um, are not the common autosomal trisomies or the sex chromosome conditions, which we would have already uh, hoped to have detected with NIPT. Um, these make up 83% of uh, chromosome conditions found in human pregnancies. We're actually doing the diagnostic testing because uh, we want to detect the atypical abnormalities that might have been missed on NIPT. So these include the rare autosomal trisomies, which may be detected on whole genome NIPT, but um, may not, um, and the copy, copy number variants, which are subchromosomal uh, changes in um, chromosome structure. And these include deletions and duplications. So we, so we offer women diagnostic testing uh, with a chromosomal microarray because microarray gives more resolution or higher resolution for the chromosome analysis. We can think of a carrier type as giving us information at a broad level like a regional map and a chromosome, uh, micro, chromosomal microarray giving us genomic resolution at say the street level. And this will enable us to detect more uh, clinically significant conditions. When women come to see us, of course, we start from the basics and take a family and medical history. There may be something in the uh, history that makes you alert to perhaps the risk of the couple being a translocation carrier or a single gene condition in the family. And Taking a detailed history also helps establish rapport. Uh, couples uh, do appreciate seeing someone who seems to take a detailed interest in um, where, what their um, background is and um, are keen to understand and get to know them before launching into discussion about invasive procedures and other tests. If it hasn't been performed already, we perform a detailed ultrasound at 13 weeks, usually through the transvaginal route, so we get very good anatomical detail. And we do know that 30% of euploid fetuses with a nuchal translucency measurement greater than 3.5 millimetres will have a structural abnormality. So it's worth having a good look, even if um, someone has been referred after, say, a 12-week scan. And this is the, the list of the malformations that we would expect to see in first trimester. Of course, the detection rate varies by the type of abnormality and the organ system. And we do get slightly better detection rates if it's towards closer to 14 weeks uh, compared with if you're doing that anatomy scan at around 11 weeks. So, what do we do next? Um, so someone has come, they've had a tertiary scan with us, we've confirmed the presence of a increased nuchal translucency measurement um, over 3.5 millimetres, but no other structural abnormality. The woman uh, is willing to have further diagnostic testing with a chromosomal microarray, but she asks what's the chance of it actually showing something um, clinically significant or important for the health of my baby. Overall, the chance of uh, finding something significant is about 5% for this group. 
and you can see we've just done um, just summarized some of the the more recent papers according to their uh, eucal translucency definitions and you can see our own data here using the two definitions there if we use a slightly different threshold and we're looking at the group with a nuchal translucency measurement of 3.0 to 3.4, then the yield is a bit lower at 1.7% there. So what do we do now? Um, assuming the woman's gone ahead, had her CVS or amniocentesis, and we've got a result that does not detect any clinically significant uh, copy number variant, then we still, um, we still see women again at 16 weeks because we find the 16 week scan actually quite helpful both for the woman's, um, the woman's peace of mind if the scan is normal or if we uh, happen to detect structural abnormalities that weren't seen earlier. So um, we can see if uh, the fetus has um, developed high drops and if the nuchal translucency measurement has evolved um, that confers one type of prognosis um, and on in this paper that was published in prenatal diagnosis looking at euploid fetuses with increased nuchal translucency 41% of the associated structural abnormalities were actually detected at 16 weeks. They weren't seen earlier at the 11 to 13 week scan. So it is um, still um, a useful way of bringing that detection um, a bit earlier than 20 weeks, which would be the routine um, second trimester morphology scan um, timing for us. So we bring them back at 16 weeks, have another look. Um, if there's more abnormalities, then we go down that particular track um, of further investigations. If things are looking like they're normalizing, it provides um, some reassurance for the couple. Now, women at this point may ask, well, are there other tests that I can have or that I should be having now? Um, we know that a chromosomal microarray doesn't test for everything. And, you know, the next big group of conditions to consider are the single gene conditions. And the biggest group of these conditions um, are the rhizopathies. Um, and the most common of these is Noonan syndrome. So this, uh, this group of... Um, this group of genes actually control cell functions, heart, skin, eyes, bone and muscles. And the prenatal phenotype typically involves cardiac abnormalities or um, high drops or fluid accumulation, such as uh, a pleural effusion or cystic hygroma or high drops. So if we see this evolve at 16 weeks, then we might consider rasopathy testing at that point. Um, and then there'll be a discussion about um, what type of testing, there are different ways to uh, test for these genes, either with a gene panel or an exome or genome sequencing. So I know um, our next speaker is going to talk a bit more about exome sequencing for, the, for um, fetuses with an increased nuchal, so I won't go into that in too much detail. So uh, when we look at the literature on the yield of rasopathy testing for an increased nuchal translucency measurement after a normal microarray, uh, it does depend on whether it's an isolated or non-isolated increased nuchal. So the yield is about 1% for fetuses uh, with an isolated NT of 3.5 millimetres or greater or greater than the 99th centile. So this is a big study from um, uh, the Netherlands here. Um, and a more, a more recent one um, showing about a detection rate of 1%. If you look at fetuses that have an increased nuchal translucency measurement and then fluid accumulation in other organs or other structural abnormalities, the yield is higher at about 14%. So that's, ugh, that's kind of where, um, where the data seems to be uh, pointing us in this direction. And so whether you offer this testing, whether it's funded by your health service, it really depends on your, um, your resources and the resources of the patient. So there's not one, there's not one size that's gonna fit everybody. Uh, and then of course, going further along, um, rather than just testing for rasopathies, your health service or your patient or you yourself might think it's more cost effective actually just to go straight to an exome because you'll detect rasopathies but you'll also detect the other things um, that uh, can, can cause um, an increased nuchal.
So it avoids the situation of doing resopathy testing and then wanting to go on and do an exome after that if you haven't found the answer. So an exome, you know, is just that one step further in terms of resolution of the genome. So going from the street level view with a chromosomal microarray down to the uh, exact address. Um, and again, um, I'll, I'll let our next speaker talk in that on more detail. This is just a table from our review paper where we've collated um, the, uh, the publications in the last few years on the use of the uh, of fetal exome sequencing for a big nuchal. And overall, it looks like the yield might be about 3.7%, and about half of these are the resopathies. Okay. Following all of this testing, assuming that no uh, specific diagnosis has been obtained, um, I think these women and their partners are often still quite anxious um, because it's quite a protracted um, diagnostic odyssey, and our genetic counsellors partic uh, particularly pick up all the um, pick up all the pieces for us, I think. So I really want to acknowledge the role they have in guiding couples through the pretty complex um, uh, clinical pathway that we're now um, sending women down. And you know, we know that a lot of couples, particularly when it's a very large nuchal translucency measurement or there are associated structural abnormalities, will choose not to continue their pregnancies. So there are lots of different choices that couples make, um, whether the genetic testing is informative or not. But we often do get to this point. We've got to, we've got past this, the 13 week scan, the 16 week scan, and then the 20 week scan, and we see a normal nuchal fold measurement. We see a structurally normal um, fetus with normal biometry. Um, and at that point, we do give women um, much more reassuring uh, counseling and tell them that the chances of having a child with a significant health issue are not significantly greater than the background risk. And so there are several studies that um, support this and really at, at some point we really do have to kind of normalize a pregnant, <laughs> normalize a pregnancy for couples. And this is kind of the, around the stage that we would do that. And that's assuming that we've had a good look at the heart and we're confident that the anatomy is normal. If views are technically difficult, we might bring a woman back at 24 weeks specifically for um, a fetal echo. But if views are good um, and there's no suspicion, we, we might not bring that woman back at 24 weeks. There was um, a recent paper which uh, gives us really helpful information for um, uh, about the long-term outcomes for these children. This was a prospective study that followed up the neurodevelopmental outcomes of over 200 children who had an isolated increased nuchal translucency measurement um, and compared it with a control group that had normal uh, nuchal translucency measurements. And they, they um, included all um, children whose NT was greater uh, than or equal to the 95th centile. And they all had standardized objective psychomotor testing at two years corrected age. And the mean developmental quotient of the increased NT group was within the normal limits, although overall it was shifted lower than the control group. Um, and these reassuring findings also applied for the smaller subgroup with the isolated NT greater than 3.5 millimeters. So that's probably the best um, long-term outcome um, data that we have and fortunately helps us um, let these couples enjoy the remainder of their pregnancy and their baby. This is a figure just summarising the diagnostic pathway and of course, um, as I said, not one size fits all. So not all couples will choose to go through all of this and of course not all health services will, uh, will, um, will offer this particular range or order of tests but certainly there for um, certainly food for thought and I hope you find it useful. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry I won't be here at question time but I'm sure Lynn and Rhiannon will be uh, more than um, more than adequately prepared to answer any questions and uh, all the details and the references from this talk are contained in our uh, review paper in prenatal diagnosis which is um, given the details are given here. So thank you very much for your attention um, and thank you for attending ISPD's virtual education series. That was a good talk from Lisa Hoy. Um
So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, but as uh, Lisa said, uh, her paper is published in, I think it's this last month's issue of prenatal diagnosis and you've got all the answers there. Um, so well, I'd like to move on now to, to ask uh, Rhiannon Mellis to talk about uh, nuchal translucencies and the association with monogenic disorders. Um, Rhiannon is uh, my PhD student at UCL, Great Ormond Street Institute of Child Health, and she has a, a general interest in prenatal genomics and her PhD is focusing on evaluating the implementation of rapid prenatal exome sequencing in our NHS. Um, so Rhiannon, over to you. Great, well, uh, thank you very much for that introduction. So uh, as you know, the topic of my talk today is going to be focusing on exome sequencing uh, for increased nuclear translucency and when should we offer it. So just as a quick overview, um, I'll touch on the current literature around the diagnostic yield of prenatal exome sequencing for fetuses with isolated increased nuchal translucency, discuss some of the challenges for using exome sequencing in that context, and then share with you some data that comes from the two largest prospective studies of prenatal exome sequencing to date, that's the PAGE study and the Columbia study. So as a quick background, as you're all well aware, uh, increased nuchal translucency, traditionally defined as greater than or equal to 3.5 millimeters measured in the first trimester, is associated with both chromosomal and subchromosomal abnormalities. It's associated with structural anomalies, in particular cardiac defects, and a growing list of monogenic disorders as well. What we also know is that for fetuses with structural abnormalities, Exome sequencing, which examines all of the coding regions of the human DNA, is a very effective tool for increasing the diagnoses of monogenic disorders. But we also know that the diagnostic yields vary a lot by phenotype. So taking, for example, these two studies, the largest ones, so that's the PAGE study um, in the top row, Lord et al, and the Columbia study underneath Petrovsky, you can see highlighted in green that the overall diagnostic yield in these studies, which sequenced fetuses with any abnormality, uh, was between eight and 10%. But breaking it down by different phenotype groups, the highest diagnostic yields were seen in fetuses with skeletal or with multi-system disorders, whereas isolated increased nuchal translucency had actually the lowest diagnostic yield of any of the groups coming out around 3%. And now rapid fetal exome sequencing is increasingly being implemented in clinical practice. So for example, within the NHS in the UK, we now have a diagnostic service across all of England offering fetal exome sequencing in certain circumstances. So now that we're doing that, it's really important that as clinicians who might be ordering this test, we have a good evidence-based understanding of which pregnancies are most likely to benefit or most likely to get a diagnosis so that we can choose testing appropriately and counsel parents about what they can expect in terms of likelihood of a diagnosis if they're having this testing. So to think about whether or when we should offer exome sequencing for increased nuchal translucency, it might be helpful to start with a look at the current literature. So uh, this group, Pauta et al, have recently published a very nice systematic review that actually summarizes all of the studies to date that have investigated the diagnostic yield of exome sequencing or indeed genome sequencing for isolated increased nuchal translucency. And so these are studies that either sequenced cohorts specifically only of fetuses with increased nuchal translucency, or they have studies that um, had larger mixed phenotype cohorts, and the authors here have extracted just the cases from those co cohorts that had isolated increased nuchal. Um, so as you can see, the size of these cohorts ranges from four up to 93 probands. The majority are fairly small case series, so six out of the 11 studies that this group identified had fewer than 20 probands in the series. And the diagnostic yield from exome sequencing ranged from zero up to 12%. But combining all of these studies together in a meta-analysis gives over 300 uh, cases. And uh, the combined pooled incremental diagnostic yield of exome sequencing came out as around 4%. So the main challenge to consider when we think about using exome sequencing for isolated increased nuclear translucency is essentially that this is a very non-specific presentation. 
meaning it can be associated with many different conditions, or it can be associated with complete resolution and subsequent normal development. So this actually makes it really difficult to interpret any genetic variants that are detected by the exome sequencing, especially given that we're still relatively lacking in comprehensive databases documenting the full spectrum of prenatal phenotypes. And because of that difficult interpretation, that might extend the time that takes for labs to report a result. And also without having a specific phenotype, it makes it much more difficult to classify a variant as pathogenic according to the ACMG guidelines. So a lot of these variants might end up being classified as variants of uncertain significance or BUS. And that's the kind of result that is very difficult to counsel parents about because you can't give them a definitive answer of what the relevance of that result really is for their pregnancy. Um, and that's particularly troubling given that parents might be wanting to use that information to make decisions about managing the pregnancy, which might include the option of having a termination. So they wouldn't want to be making that decision based on very uncertain information. And then the second challenge relates to how we interpret published reports about the clinical utility of exome sequencing for isolated increased nuclear translucency, because actually there are a few different ways of defining or interpreting what we actually mean by isolated. So for one thing, it depends upon, of course, the gestation at which the uh, uh, presentation is made. So an increased nuclear translucency that's isolated in the first trimester may go on to have an evolving phenotype and that fetus actually then has a cardiac phenotype or a multi-system phenotype. Um, so when we are sort of reading reports about diagnostic yield of exome sequencing, it's important to know whether we're talking about cases that presented with isolated increased nuchal translucency or cases where it remained isolated and wasn't associated with other features later on. And also it depends, again, different definitions of what you class as isolated. Are we counting so-called soft markers um, as additional abnormalities or are we counting that um, as still being part of the isolated group. So with those kind of challenges in mind, I'd just now like to share with you some work that we've done recently to look a bit more closely at the use of exome sequencing for isolated increased nuchal translucency in our cohort. So this is a piece of work that we did recently with collaborators from Dr. Ron Wapner's group at Columbia. Um, and we are taking the combined extended data sets of the PAGE and Columbia studies. So now that those two studies are complete and their data sets uh, are larger than they were at the time when the interim analysis was published in 2019, we set out to review the findings for all of the fetuses in that combined cohort that presented initially with increased nuchal translucency. And so we wanted to look at the natural histories, the outcomes, the diagnostic variants that were found in those cases, and look at the factors that influence the diagnostic yield and touch on the implications that that has for clinical guidelines in practice. So this that we did was a retrospective analysis of prospectively collected data. So taking the two study cohorts together, we extracted any case um, that had increased nuchal translucency. And just for a bit of background, these two studies uh, were both studies that sequenced fetuses with any structural abnormality at all, where the carrier type and microarray were normal or deemed non-causative of the phenotype. Uh, in the PAGE study, there's now a total of 876 fetuses of which 610 were previously reported. In the Columbia study, there are 494 of which 234 were previously reported. The exome sequencing was done mostly in trios of the fetus and both parents. Uh, and in PAGE, the exome data was, uh, was interpreted through a targeted analysis of around 1600 genes associated with developmental disorders. Whereas in the Columbia cohort, the analysis was untargeted or gene agnostic. In both studies, the results were returned to the families. In PAGE, that was after the end of the pregnancy. And in the Columbia study, that was whenever the results were available. So as I mentioned, what we did was to extract cases from the study database that presented in the first trimester and were coded with any HPO term that indicated increased nuchal translucency, whether that was in isolation or in combination with other structural abnormalities. And uh, just to note that as well as kind of structural abnormalities, 
like uh, cardiac or renal abnormalities, we also classified high drops as an additional feature. We also uh, classified soft markers such as echogenic bowel as an additional feature. So in order to go into the isolated group, that was really fetuses that only had increased nuchal translucency and no other features at all. So we classified those cases by manually reviewing the clinical information that we had, including the ultrasound scan reports from when the case is presented and also further ultrasound scans from later in pregnancy. And then we reviewed what variants were found, calculated the diagnostic yields and compared them according to whether or not there were additional abnormalities and according to what the size of the nuchal translucency was at presentation. And then we also looked at the pregnancy outcomes and the postnatal or postmortem findings where those were available. So in total, we pulled out from the cohort 213 cases that had increased nuchal translucency at presentation. And of those, you can see that 54 were already associated with other abnormalities at the time of presentation in the first trimester. And in that subgroup, 22% uh, of the cases had a diagnostic variant on exome sequencing. Whereas on the other side, in green on the slide, 159 cases had isolated increased nuchal translucency at presentation. And ultimately, 10% of that group did go on to have diagnostic variants. And uh, you'll notice that that's a little bit higher than the figure of 3 to 4% that we've just discussed on the previous slides. So I'll come on in a moment to why that is. So in total, that was 28 diagnostic variants that were detected in this whole cohort. And in addition, there were eight variants detected in the PAGE study that were designated as potentially clinically relevant. Um, and that's because they were variants that could have a plausible association with the phenotype in the fetus, but there wasn't enough evidence to be able to call them diagnostic based on the prenatal phenotype alone. So that's because of that point about it being very difficult to make that interpretation when the phenotype itself is nonspecific. So let's look a bit closer now at this group that presented with isolated increased nuchal translucency. So of 159 fetuses, 37 actually went on to develop additional features on subsequent scanning later in the pregnancy. And out of this subgroup, 32% had a diagnostic variant on the exome sequencing. Whereas on the other hand, the 111 cases where the nuchal translucency either persisted but remained isolated, or for the most part, it actually resolved uh, altogether. In that group, you can see that the diagnostic yield was much, much lower and was less than 2%. There were also seven pregnancies that ended before any further ultrasound scans could be done. So in those cases, we don't know whether or not they would have developed any additional structural abnormalities if the pregnancy had continued. Um, and in that small group, there were two diagnostic variants giving a yield of 28%. Um, and there were also four cases that were lost to follow up and didn't have any subsequent scans that we could access. So those were excluded from the subsequent analysis. So the next thing to look at is uh, what types of abnormalities developed in these cases uh, where additional features were seen later in the pregnancy. So you can see on this slide that as you might expect, cardiac abnormalities were by far the commonest type of additional abnormality to develop later on in this group. Um, and that makes sense given the known association between increased nuchal translucency and cardiac defects. Um, that was followed by uh, brain abnormalities and also high drops. And then in terms of diagnoses that were seen in this group, again, it's probably not surprising that the commonest category of diagnoses were rasopathies, which accounted for one third of the diagnoses made in this group. Um, and the rest of the diagnoses were a mixture of various other kind of syndromic conditions. Um, so next, let's look at the cases where the increased nuchal translucency remained isolated or resolved, because these are probably the cases that pose the biggest challenge in terms of kind of prognosticating and how we counsel parents um, about what the residual risk is. So in this subgroup, there were two diagnoses made based on exome sequencing. So the first one was in a fetus that presented with a nuchal translucency of just 3.5 millimeters at 12 weeks of gestation, and there were no other structural abnormalities on scans throughout the rest of the pregnancy. The pregnancy resulted in a live-born infant, 
which had no congenital abnormalities uh, on examination at birth. So initially, this variant that was detected in the gene you can see, RE, RE, that was initially classified as uncertain significance. Um, but actually, at eight months of age, the infant then was found to have clinical features that would be consistent with that condition. So that gene causes a neurodevelopmental disorder with or without congenital structural abnormalities. So that variant was actually reclassified during the course of the study and reported back to the family. And then the other case comes from the PAGE study. And this was actually a case uh, of chromosome 15 uniparental dysomy that had not been picked up on the microarray prior to enrollment in the study. So this was a fetus that had a nuchal translucency of 4.8 millimeters in the first trimester, again, had normal scans throughout the rest of the pregnancy, was born at term, was small for gestational age, but otherwise no structural abnormalities. Um, and we don't have any further postnatal follow-up on that case to know whether they developed features of Prader-Willi syndrome, which is what you would expect from chromosome 15 maternal UPD. And then in this isolated increased nuchal group, there were also two cases that had these variants I mentioned of potential clinical relevance, where they couldn't be classified at the time as being definitively diagnostic. So the variant in KMT2A uh, remains unresolved in terms of whether or not that was relevant even after postnatal follow-up. But the case with the variant in KMT2D, which causes Kabuki syndrome, um, that child was actually followed up after the end of the study and at the age of 18 months had developed features uh, consistent with Kabuki syndrome, even though at birth there had been no abnormalities detected. Um, so that variant retrospectively could now be reclassified as pathogenic. Um, and then finally, we also looked to see the size of the nuchal translucency in all cases that presented with isolated increased nuchal to see how that correlated with the diagnostic yield. So on the bar chart here, you can see that the majority of the cases in the cohort had measurements that were towards the lower end of the range. And as you might expect, it was the ones with the larger measurements at presentation that were the most likely to have a diagnostic variant. So in the uh, table on the left there, you can see that in those with a nuchal measuring greater than 7.5 millimeters, 28% had a diagnostic variant on exome sequencing. Whereas at the other end of the scale, there was only one diagnostic variant found out of 63 cases where the nuchal was less than 4.5 millimeters. But having said that, it's worth bearing in mind that actually most cases with a diagnostic variant were those that developed additional features later in the pregnancy, regardless of what the measurement was at presentation. So perhaps the presence of those additional structural abnormalities is still the stronger predictor of the diagnostic yield. So we've seen here from our data that in our cohort, the diagnostic yield of exome sequencing for completely isolated increased nuchal translucency, and by that I mean uh, when no other anomalies develop later in the pregnancy either, is pretty low at around 2%. But on the other hand, fetuses with increased nuchal translucency were much more likely to have a diagnosis if there were additional structural anomalies or high drops. And that was whether those were present at presentation in the first trimester or later in pregnancy. And we didn't find any significant difference in the diagnostic rate between the cases that had additional abnormalities at presentation versus those where the additional features developed later. As we've seen, the increasing size of the nuchal translucency also correlated with increased diagnostic yield. And as we discussed, the, var the variant interpretation is very difficult in isolated increased nuchal translucency. So the presence of additional abnormalities facilitates that interpretation, as well as there being an a priori greater likelihood of there being a monogenic disorder. So all of this has implications for how we might offer fetal exome sequencing in clinical practice. And one possible strategy that you might suggest based on these findings would be to say, let's avoid exome sequencing in isolated increased nuchal translucency in the first trimester, but instead follow those cases up with early anomaly scanning um, and see whether any additional features have developed at 16 to 18 weeks. And if they have, then perhaps offer exome sequencing at that stage. And that sort of strategy would potentially fit quite well with what many providers are already doing. So as you heard in the previous talk, 
a lot of providers already offer a follow-up scan at around 16 weeks to check the fetal heart and check for other anatomical abnormalities. So this kind of deferred testing strategy for exome sequencing could fit in quite well with what's already being done in terms of the scanning. So doing that strategy, if you applied that to our cohort, that would have avoided 116 negative exomes. But on the other hand, it would have missed two diagnoses um, in the ones where no additional abnormalities developed later. Sorry, the lights have just gone out where I am. There you go, they're back on. <laughs> um, and it's also really important to bear in mind the patient experience. So of course, couples who've had an increased mucal translucency picked up in the first trimester are bound to be anxious and worrying about what this means for their baby. So waiting longer for additional testing might be something that um, contributes to further anxiety. And it'll be really important to do more research around parent views and preferences to find out whether this sort of staged approach to testing would be acceptable to them as well. So as you've seen here, our data suggested that fetal exome sequencing probably has limited clinical utility for isolated increased nuchal translucency, but that timely and careful follow-up ultrasound scanning to identify other anomalies as they emerge might allow us to focus that testing where the likelihood of the diagnosis is higher. And any guidelines for clinical practice need to balance maximizing the potential to make as many diagnoses as we can with also realistic allocation of resources, which of course are finite. Um, and ongoing research will definitely be needed as fetal exome sequencing is increasingly implemented in clinical practice and as our understanding of fetal phenotypes continues to evolve. So finally, just to revisit the title of the talk, and ask the question, when should we offer prenatal exome sequencing for increased nuchal translucency? And this is by no means case closed, but I'd like to suggest two different answers to that question for different settings. So for reporting results in the setting of clinical diagnostic services, it's really important that we have a high degree of confidence in the genotype phenotype correlation in order to be able to report back results that can inform management of the pregnancy and also inform future reproductive options for further pregnancies. And of course, we also have to consider in healthcare settings, the cost effectiveness of testing, particularly in publicly funded healthcare systems like the NHS in the UK, because prenatal exome sequencing has to be done in trios in order to make it fast enough. Um, and so that remains fairly costly and labor intensive. So at the moment, for example, in the NHS, there's not really capacity to offer it in all pregnancies with isolated increased nuchal translucency. So for now, in the clinical setting, it would perhaps seem sensible to only offer exome sequencing in the context of an increased nuchal plus other abnormalities. And maybe there's a case to be made for also offering it in uh, isolated increased nuchal if the measurement is very large. And as I mentioned, this has actually been implemented in the NHS in England, and the criteria that are being used in that service are that exome sequencing is offered where there's a nuchal translucency of equal to or greater than 6.5 millimeters plus any other abnormality, which could be a soft marker, and it's also offered in cases of non-immune fetal high drops. On the other hand, though, in research settings, I think it's important that we probably do continue to do exome sequencing for a wider range of fetal presentations in order to further expand our knowledge of fetal phenotypes and of prenatal presentations of monogenic disorders that might be different to what's already recognized in the postnatal context. So in that setting, it would be very beneficial to offer prenatal exome sequencing for isolated increased nucleus as well, if we had uh, studies that do detailed phenotyping and include postnatal follow-up, because that might help to answer some of the questions that still remain around this and inform future changes to clinical practice. So I'd just like to say thank you all for your attention um, and thank you to the organisers for the opportunity to present today. I'd also like to thank everyone involved in the PAGE and Columbia studies, uh, particularly, of course, Lynn Chitty and our co-authors and collaborators from Dr. Waltman's group at Columbia and I'd be happy to take any questions. Let me stop sharing the screen. The question here is, we have got time for five minutes for some questions, so if cost was not an issue, 
would you offer whole exome sequencing for nucleus 3.5 to 5 millimeters? Do you want to answer that, Rihanna? I'll have a go. I think it's a tricky one. I'm sure you can weigh in as well, Lynn, um, because if cost was no object, then obviously you could potentially expand the remit, but that doesn't get rid of the problem that interpreting the results is still incredibly difficult and um, particularly at the kind of lower range of the measurements. If there are no other structural abnormalities to go on, I think you're probably at more risk of getting a result of uncertain significance than a helpful result. What do you think? I think exactly that. I think interpreting the sequencing results is going to be very challenging. I'm trying to turn my video back on, but I'm afraid I can't at the moment. Any other questions? Do we report uncertain results? Um, the answer is no. We are we are only um, we are only reporting pathogenic or likely pathogenic results in in the NHS that explain the phenotype. Very occasionally, there might be a variant of unknown significance which may be uh, um, uh, responsible. In that case, we will. Um, uh, in that case, we will. Um, in that case, we will um, report them to the return to the referring clinician. If, I can't see the questions in the chat, unfortunately. So, if anybody has any other questions, are there any other questions? Ah, may I know any data, diagnostic yield about the use of prenatal exome sequences in fetuses with normal nuchal translucency and normal morphology scan? Well, there you go. The answer is we have no idea because we're not doing that. Um, I know that there is a paper in um, being under review in prenatal diagnosis on this, um, but I, I'm not aware of the data just as yet for that. Um, Rhiannon, uh, I've already answered this. Do you think the chromosome, you, the, you, the chromosome, the UPD and the RE variant could be coincidental findings? I think I but my answer yes. to that was yes, it could be. They could and be. Need, yeah, they're rare diseases and we'd need to do a whole series to see whether or not all, all UPDs had increased nuclear, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And are there any gen genetic conditions causing lymphatic anomalies detected on WES in our cohort? The answer to that is certainly in the NHS we have had some. Yes. Yeah. And also in Page there was an F and B4 as well. That's a lymphatic yeah. one, I think. And another question, would you say her risk is back to baseline if the nuchal translucency is greater than 3.5, normal chromosome, normal array, negative rasopathy testing, no structural abnormalities, even if no way is performed? I think that you can never say never, but I think that, an, that, that if, a, if you have a normal array and a normal detailed anatomy scan, with an NT of 3.5, the vast majority of those fetuses, those babies are going to be completely normal. And here we go again, is it different if it's five millimeters? Well, I think, uh, I think Rhiannon and I think also Lisa answered that question, that as the nuchal translucency increases, then the risk of an abnormal outcome is, is um, higher. I don't understand the next one. So, okay, the next question is, and this might need to be the last one. In 2019, we published a study on prenatal rasopathies in which we stated the cutoff measurement for testing in isolated NT is five millimeters. We had a very large cohort, maybe interesting to compare to the NHS criteria. Yeah, we can do that. Um, yeah, that would be interesting. Look at that. I think, again, it depends whether this is uh, a selected cohort or not. Do you offer regular growth scans when nuchal translucency is greater than 3.5 millimeters with all the rest negative? If the nuchal translucency is three, greater than 3.5, most people, as far as I'm aware in the UK, are offering a, a detailed cardiac scan and also the standard routine 20-week anomaly scan. The use of growth scans um, in England is variable, but there's an increasing trend towards having a third trimester growth scan. If the nuchal translucency is obviously thick at 10 weeks, how to proceed? I think we'd do the same as, as, as Lisa had suggested before, manage it in that way. 
were all the additional anomalies seen before 24 weeks gestation? Oh, good question. Um, off the top of my head, I think the vast majority were seen before 24 weeks. Okay, this is a very controversial one. I'm not sure that we can answer this one in one go. Uh, given that the amnio is most likely preferred, would it also be a consideration not to perform nuchal translucency measurements anymore and defer the first trimester ultrasound to 16 weeks, obviating NT measurement? I think that's a, a loaded question and a difficult one to, to answer. Um, certainly, if you, well, it, depends what, it depends what sort of screening you're doing. Most people are still doing combined testing for Down syndrome, even if you're offering NIPT as well. So I know that the Netherlands and Belgium are offering NIPT as their primary screen, but certainly in uh, England and I think many other places around the world, we are still offering um, NIPT as a contingent test. So you would still need nuchal translucency measurements. And deferring the first trimester ultrasound to 16 weeks, I think is challenging. I think 16 week scans are still challenging. I think you can see an awful lot at 12 to 14 weeks. Uh, quite easily. So I, I think there'd be a bit of an argument against that. Also, you need an early early dating scan. I answered that for I've answered that for Rhiannon because Rhiannon is a geneticist. I'm the one that's done some obstetrics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's all the questions from the QA. So I'd like to thank both of our speakers and I'd like to thank you all uh, for um, attending uh, today. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, Rhiannon's um, Data is published in the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynaecology sometime in the last couple of weeks or months rather, and Lisa's in prenatal diagnosis. Um, the presentation was recorded and is available on the ISPD website uh, within the next week. And um, certificates of attendance for today's talk will be sent out by ISPD within 15 days. So you can count this for CPD. Um, the virtual education series will resume next month and we will have some more sessions. Um, they've been very popular and I hope you've enjoyed them. So thank you all and have a good morning, day, evening, wherever you are. Thank you very much indeed.